Greetings, I'm C. Henry Adams, and you're listening to Social Networking with C. Henry Adams and the crew. Happy Mardi Gras to you. All right, get ready. We're going to be speaking to the grandfather of the Internet. Stay tuned. Social Networking with C. Henry Adams and the crew discuss information technology and advanced technology that benefits small to medium-sized business. Stay tuned. Today on Social Networking with C. Henry Adams and the crew, we will interview Dr. David J. Farber. Dr. David J. Farber is the Distinguished Career Professor of Computer Science and Public Policy, Carnegie Mellon University Institute for Software Research. He is an Alfred Fittler Moore Professor Emeritus of Telecommunications at the University of Pennsylvania, a former Chief Technologist of the Federal Communications Commission, and a graduate of Stevens Institute of Technology in 1956, to say the very least. track when it's going you can't turn it back it's a whirlwind twisting around and you can't slow it down don't speak i know what's on your mind just kiss me leave it all behind there's no use waiting oh hell's Cause we can't deny it It's something so strong We're never gonna fight it Fine. It is truly an honor to have you in my presence. 
Dr. Farber, you are well known throughout the information technology industry and world, to say the least. As one of the most distinguished scholars of computer science, as well as the Internet, many years ago, you and your colleagues created the information system. Did you have any idea that one day it would cause countries and people to change their lives in a significant manner? No, I don't think we, we realized. We realized that it would make changes. Part of what we want to do is make changes in our science and in, in the way people use computers, but nobody expected it to quite take off the way it took off. And that was due to two things. First, it's hard to predict the future. And second of all, the reason, one of the big reasons that it had the impact it has was, was the advent of the personal computer. When the net started, there were fairly big machines that were attached to it, and there were people being able to access the net through those big machines, but it wasn't the type of environment that you'd expect you know, a person to have access to. There were scientists, there were engineers that had access. What publication have you read or even written that could inspire our listeners to improve the technical knowledge or skills from a labor standpoint? Oh, there are a whole set of papers and books written. There's a book by John Markoff, I forget its title right now, which is a pretty good introduction to sort of the history of the, the Internet. There are a lot of books like that written. Kathy, what's her name? Hefner. I, I don't have it, the name right on my fingertips. Also wrote a book. But there are a number of published books. Articles are all over the place. Some of them are accurate, some aren't. It's hard to pin down one that's easily accessible that really is a a good introduction. But if you if you read the New York Times, some of the old New York Times articles, they're not bad. Considering the uprising in certain countries located in the Middle East and North Africa, do you think Facebook, Twitter, or even Google have served as a significant impact on that particular portion of the world. Oh, yes, yes. They they were the mechanism which let people get together in, in virtual space. One of the problems of organizing any social activity, especially the type that's happened in parts of the world, is communication is needed. And, you know, meeting on street corners doesn't quite work. And that's always been a problem. The Internet provides that vehicle. You saw that even if you went back, what, about eight, nine years now, you saw a, a politician in South Korea use the Internet very effectively to win an election that everybody thought he had no chance of winning because he could get his supporters together easily in virtual space. He could raise money. He could propagate ideas. Uh, we do it here. The last election had an awful lot of Internet uh, Politicking, and that's become a common form right now of getting people to understand at least what you claim as your ideas. Uh, that's just as good for more strident political actions. And if you go, if you go back to, for instance, the days uh, 1917 with Russian Revolution, the Soviet Revolution, they had real problems organizing people. If they had had the internet, it would have been trivial. Okay. But so it. You know, it strikes both ways. It's a vehicle for political change. It's also a vehicle, if used right, for making sure that people's needs are understood by their governments if they wish to hear them. Dr. Farber, is there any project that you are currently working on that you could share or to our listeners, or do you have any insight instead that you could share? Yeah, there are some activities. The people have said that the Internet caused a, and the PC revolution both made the last 25 years really interesting in many ways. The next 10 years could be just as evolutionary, revolutionary. Take your chance. I'm a big fan of looking at virtual reality as a mechanism for people to interact with each other. It's a technology, being able to attend a meeting and appear to be part of that meeting even though you're, you're remote, I think it's going to have a big impact on bringing the world together. Right now, we two of us can do a video conference or an audio conference, but it gets it bogs down rapidly if you have a, a lot of people. I'd like to be able to attend a 20-person meeting and feel like I'm there, feel like I'm, I'm 
actually interacting with those people, even though I can't quite touch them. And I think that's probably going to be the next step. It will cause social changes, but it's sort of a natural extension of things like Facebook and Twitter and all the things that have, have turned out to be very exciting in many uses of the word exciting and it's in the future. It will go also from a technical standpoint. I think you're beginning to see things like voice recognition mature. Now, I can now talk to a computer. I can have it transcribe what I said. And that's become a very common thing used in both business, the press, and individuals. If you look five years ago, it was almost impossible to do it effectively. Now we can do it. We can, we can tell the computer what we want it to do. I think that's going to have a big effect. And finally, mobility is going to be the key to the future. I'm talking on a, on a, on a smart cell phone. I, that is my, almost my main instrument now of accessing the information sitting on the net, my mail, etc. It's not the best, obviously. It's small, but it's powerful. Uh, the, the computer that's in here, I started working at Bell Laboratories, which was at that point a major research institution and uh, certainly in the forefront of information technology. The computer I have in my, my iPhone is more powerful than the computers we had in the entire Bell Laboratories, and that's going to increase in the future. So I can see a world where all these things combine, and I'm always connected when I choose to be connected with with this you know, virtual information world that's out there, and if I have a question to ask, I just say, you know, something like, iPhone, what's the status of that? You see that in science fiction movies, where we're essentially almost there right now. That's going to be interesting in many, many ways. Thank you, Dr. Farber. I know that you are a very busy man, and we know that we had to reschedule this interview, but thank you so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking to Dr. David J. Farber. He has had a distinguished career. When I say distinguished, I mean distinguished career as a professor of computer science. He has worked with the FCC as the chief technologist. He has retired as the Alfred Fittler Moore Professor of Telecommunication Systems at the University of Pennsylvania. Once again, I, I greatly thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, good talking to you. Is, is there any way that anyone could contact you if they wanted to, or do you prefer? Well, I have an email address that everybody knows. That it's davidfarber.net. Email is my favorite way of talking to people. Well, thank you so very much, Dr. Farber, for coming on Social Networking with C. Henry and the crew. If you are a singer-songwriter and would like to debut your song on Social Networking with C. Henry Adams and the crew, give us a call or text at 404-348-8319. You can also email us at media at biemediagroup.com. If you are an artist and would like to debut your music on Social Networking with C. Henry Adams and the crew, and feel free to send us a copy. And we would be glad to debut your song on our show. Hi, I'm Esther. And I'm C. Henry. When it comes to broadcasting your audio commercial, voiceover presentation, or special event, you want the very best. That's, That's where, where we, we come, come in. in. Go ahead, C. Okay, Esther Caspino is perhaps one of the best voiceover artists known in the southeastern region of the United States. A Broadcasting Interest Enterprise Corporation is proud to work with her to offer a rather unique service to the radio industry as well as the public. For 11 years, you might have heard my voiceover work and never imagined that I could serve you in other ways. 
Well, with today's advanced technology, your traffic report, weather report, voiceover commercial, presentation, or special event is just a click away from a computer. To learn more about our services and rates, give us a call at 404 404- 348-8319 or media at bymediagroup.com. 